Hello and welcome to Magic Concepts, a series where we explore Magic the Gathering concepts, starting from zero knowledge in the game and going all the way through Pro Tour level strategies. Back in part three of this series, we covered the importance of card advantage and the different ways to leverage that against your opponent. But today we are looking at a different way that you can leverage the game into your favor, and that is with a concept called tempo. You might be familiar with the term tempo from uh, music terminology as to how fast a song progresses or how many beats per minute. And while tempo does dictate the pace of the magic game, it does not necessarily mean how fast you take your turns but rather it's measured by how many turns it will take for you to kill your opponent. This is also called the game clock. In its most basic form, tempo can be measured by what's called your board presence, or by what permanents you have in play and how they match up against your opponents. Now because you're comparing your board state to that of your opponents, tempo is relative. So even if you have huge creatures out that can kill your opponent in one turn, if they have equally big creatures that can block it, or even a lot of smaller ones, the pace of the game may easily have evened out and not really favoring either player. Now, tempo is often gained at the expense of card advantage. Having to use one or more spells to remove your opponent's biggest threat, for example. But you might be able to leverage a tempo advantage into a card advantage by pressuring your opponent's life total and forcing them to make bad blocks or chump blocks just so that they don't lose the game. Probably the best way to gain and measure your tempo is by how efficiently you're using your mana. Way back in part two of this series, we introduced the concept of the mana curve. Now, this is very important as it relates to tempo. If every card in your deck is a high cost, high impact spell, for example, then your first few turns will be completely wasted just playing land and passing the turn to your opponent. And if your opponent can make better use of their mana, putting down smaller creatures and attacking every turn, well then you'll be so far behind when you finally cast your first creature that you might not be able to catch back up. So keeping a healthy mix of low cost creatures and spells will help to ensure that you're using all of your mana every turn. Now sometimes the only play you can make isn't necessarily the best play. For example, if you have a three mana cost removal spell like Seal from Existence, and your opponent only has a 2 mana cost creature on the field, is casting your removal on such a small creature wasted when it could hit something bigger down the road? Well, if you don't have anything else to do, it might make sense to drop your removal spell now, because your next few turns could be spent casting a 4 or even 5 drop creatures, and removing your opponent's early tempo might keep you from falling behind it's important to remember that tempo is relative to your opponent. So removing their tempo advantage can equate to a tempo advantage of your own. So tempo is mostly about developing your board and using your mana effectively, and your lands are a major part of that. Each land that you play gives you mana to use every turn for the rest of the game. You can think of this mana as your budget for casting spells. And this is why making your land drop every turn for the first few turns of the game is so critical to give you the resources or the budget that you need to cast all of your spells effectively and not fall behind on tempo. Now some lands, like Windscarred Crag, enter the battlefield tapped. This means that you actually miss out on their mana, or tempo, the turn that they come into play. But oftentimes they make up for it on future turns through the flexibility of choosing which color to produce, and sometimes added bonuses like gaining life. 
A card like Terramorphic Expanse is another example of this. While it doesn't enter tapped, it doesn't produce any mana on its own, and the land that it searches for does enter tapped. So this initial tempo investment needs to be weighed carefully when determining when to play these tap lands. If you need the mana now to keep on curve, then playing a basic land instead, if you have one available, would be the better play, and waiting a turn or two until you can afford to effectively use one mana in order to invest in future turns with these tap lands. Now, if a player is playing aggressively, deploying threats and attacking every turn, they are said to be the proactive player, or the player that is setting the tempo of the game. The other player is forced into a more reactive role, having to defend themselves and trying to answer the opponent's threats. Now, the proactive player can take the initiative to push their game plan and make the other player react. If you can take the initiative in this way to push your tempo, then your opponent will have a very hard time attacking you back because they will be forced to defend their life total against your creatures. And if you're forcing your opponent to block, then you can put even more pressure on them by removing key blockers through the use of combat tricks, resulting in a huge tempo swing in your advantage. Now for the proactive player, Creatures also require a big investment, not only in the mana that you have to use to cast them, but also because in Magic, when a creature enters the battlefield, it is not able to attack or use tap abilities the turn it comes into play. This is what is known as summoning sickness. But it's not the end of the world. One way to leverage more tempo is to include creatures in your deck that have the haste ability, which means that they can act immediately and get around summoning sickness, or that they have other ETB or enter the battlefield triggers, such as Red Cap's backup ability. This backup ability will put a plus one counter on one of your creatures. Uh, if it's a different creature, then it also gains the Red Cap's first strike ability. So you can effectively borrow that ability from Red Cap Heal Slasher and use it on another creature for the turn. So you gain the tempo advantage for casting Red Cap, even though Red Cap himself can't attack because of Summoning Sickness. And these abilities help you keep pressuring your opponent without losing any tempo. Another good tempo-based strategy is to cast a lot of small creatures or have other permanents like Baird that generate creatures every turn with no additional mana investment pumping them up through different abilities, and attacking in for lethal before your opponent can answer all of them. This is also called a swarm strategy, because you're trying to build up a critical mass of creatures that can attack around your opponent's blockers. Because remember, the opponent's creatures can only block one creature with one of their creatures. They could block one of your creatures with two or more of their own creatures, but they cannot block two or more of your creatures with one of theirs. So if you have more creatures than your opponent does, they can't block them all. And you're going to push some amount of damage through. As the game goes into later turns, and your opponent is able to start casting bigger creatures that can block and even kill your smaller creatures, it's important to be able to push your advantage. Just because one or two attackers might die is not a reason to call off the attack entirely. As we were saying, if you have more creatures than your opponent does, you can still push through enough damage to possibly even kill your opponent, or if not, at least get them severely low to where one or two more attacks might do so. And it might be worth losing some of your attackers in order to get them to that critical life total. But if you can remove some of their creatures before blocks are even made, then it can be a devastating blow that your opponent might not be able to recover from. So just to recap on tempo, it is based mostly on your board state relative to your opponents and how quickly you might be able to overcome them. Taking the initiative in a game can put your opponent on the defensive and give you an advantage in the game. Pushing that tempo advantage by removing opposing blockers can help you keep on top even later in the game. 
swarming the opponent by attacking with more creatures than they're able to block can keep them on the defensive even if their creatures are bigger. Using creatures that have the haste ability or other enter the battlefield triggers can help negate the initial tempo cost of casting creatures as it gets around summoning sickness. But as we've gone over the different concepts of tempo, what does it look like in an actual game? All right, well, this hand looks weird, but I don't need a red until turn four, so let's go ahead and keep it and see what happens. Hopefully I'll draw a mountain at some point. So we'll start off with our swooping lookout, our very good turn one play. Ooh, he's got a very good turn one play of his own. All right, so I believe I could do Invasion of Gobukun now, but if he puts the Pegasus in front of my lookout, then I am pretty well hosed. So we're going to attack first to see if he blocks. He does block, so we're able to go ahead and get rid of his Pegasus. So that does kind of put me back a turn, but it puts him uh, back a turn in tempo, too. So, I mean, we're still kind of neck and neck. I do have another removal spell for next turn, two more actually, so I can uh, get rid of something if I need to. Like that. So this definitely needs to die. He can make something a 3-3 three, three this turn. So, yep. So, yeah. We're gonna... Go ahead and get rid of that. It stays a 3-3? Three, three? Okay, good. I thought it, it went away. Celebrity Fencer. Really good card. Um, Destroy Evil is a good counter to that because it's going to get pretty big. So I think I'm going to do Gobukan. So yep, we'll go ahead and delay Darling of the Masses. We'll go ahead and swing on in. I wish I had some more creatures. Or a mountain. A mountain would work too. Uh, let's see. Best thing here is if that's a creature. Nope. They attack with fencer. Okay. That really is the best thing for me. So now I can just smite it. And we just get rid of all of their tempo. Another smite. Okay. Well. I suppose we'll just keep going at the invasion. There's nothing else to do. Uh, they are going to get Darling of the Masses down this turn, though. And that's going to start making some tokens for them. But it is a 2-4, so it dies to destroy evil. Oh, no. They're doing something else here. Crowbar. Okay, that's fine. I can smite Crowbar. Oh, that gets rid of my seal from existence. That's bad. Okay, so that's a tap ability on the artifact the equipped creature gets that ability okay so i have to kill the citizen this turn so unfortunately this really sucks that i have to do this so we are going to seal the crowbar he can have the token i don't care about the token i'm getting rid of the crowbar because the crowbar will get rid of the seal on Ren. So I definitely need that to go away. That I am wasting essentially a three mana spell is worth it. So we finally got Light Shield Array turned around. So now Swooping Lookout can start gaining counters on its own. If I could ever draw a mountain, I might be in business. Darling finally hits, that's fine. Mountain! There we go! Alright. So now I have a decision. I can either drop Baird and start collecting tokens. I can do Heal Slasher. 
to make my lookout bigger. Um, what I'm going to do here is go for Baird and destroy Evil because I really want to make sure that Darling of the Masses does not get to start generating tokens. So we'll attack with my flyer. He can't block. We'll drop Baird to start my token generation. And because it's an attack trigger, I'm just going to go ahead and destroy it now so that he doesn't even untap with it. And another crowbar. Okay, well that is some bad for me. Although I do have Light Shield Array now, so that can give uh, all my permanents hexproof. Oh, only creatures, not permanents. Oh, well that's bad. Very, very bad. Okay, so he doesn't have anything to do... What he should have done is put Crowbar on his other token and then activated it immediately. Letting me untap is just uh, begging for trouble. So I am going to go to combat and try to bait the citizen into a block on my token. Because the 2-2 two -two should block the 1-1. One -one, so that I'm trying to bait that block. Very nice. And so now we can... Except smiting it doesn't really stop what's about to happen. Oops, I forgot to play my land for the turn. Well, he can still uh, attach Crowbar and use it to free Ren. And it looks like that's what he's doing. Unfortunately, I can't stop it this time. So Ren is going to hit the field again. I just hope that I have enough power to stop it or kill it at this point. He's blowing up Light Shield Array? Really? Okay. I mean, instead anyway, I might as well activate it. That was not what I expected. I definitely expected him to go for the Seal from Existence. Uh, so now at this point, we've got... A pretty well free reign here. So we'll go ahead and put the backup on Baird. Uh, we'll go ahead and swing in with everything uh, except the 1-1. One, one. Uh, if he wants to block here, he doesn't really have any good blocks. He has to give something up. And so we're able to push that advantage and just keep pressuring his life total. Okay, well that does nothing. Opponent is pretty well out of gas at this point. Yup. And so this is the tempo deck that we were using. Uh, hopefully this video has helped you understand the concept of tempo and how keeping your mana curve and curving out by casting creatures every turn can help you push tempo and help overwhelm your opponent's board. Because tempo is, like I said, based on your board state relative to your opponent. Taking the initiative with your creatures, forcing the attacks, forcing your opponent to make bad blocks will help pressure their life total and eventually you'll just have a swarm of creatures on your board. We saw kind of Elspeth pumping out tokens every turn. Uh, Baird can do it to Invasion of Gobicon if you're able to flip it. We'll just keep giving you plus one counters every turn, making everything bigger. And your opponent just isn't going to keep up with the insane tempo advantage that you can get from uh, focusing on this kind of strategy. So I hope this helped. Uh, please go ahead and put a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel for more of these concept videos. And let me know what you think in the comments below. I would love to hear any questions you guys might have. And I would love to answer them for you as best I can. So until next time, I will see you in the next video.